सो माय टॉप जस्ट मिनट this is mainly for the motivation and uh, my background is in both mathematics and computer science so uh, i am here representing both the domains of computer science and mathematics uh, i did my phd under the super supervision of dr fakir bharti in the area of uh, graph algorithms so uh, my phd work also consisted of both parts the theoretical part as well as the algorithmic or the computer science part so uh, if we talk about the computer science students uh, they are not that much comfortable with mathematical concepts as the mathematics students are and uh, some mathematics students are not comfortable with programming or computer science stuff so uh, machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence or data science these are the keywords here and uh, my talk is to motivate all the mathematicians here that the basics of machine learning lies not in computer science but in mathematics so i'll be discussing a few uh, topics re related to history some key concepts that was developed in 1905 1906 by mathematicians and those concepts are still in 2024 being used in machine learning concepts machine learning algorithms right? and in some cases they are the fundamental blocks right? so uh, i'll uh, give you a brief a walk through of the key components that we have in machine learning right so the first part is the data collection right i'll go through each one of these uh, in the upcoming slides uh, so the first part whenever we want to do something related to data we need data and there are different methods to collect data uh, we will discuss that then uh, we need to pre process the data just to make sure that which of those data are correct how much of those data can be used and in which in which uh capacity can we use them then uh, there are many uh, machine learning algorithms right neural networks is one of the famous ones uh, uh, there are some graph based algorithms as well for example random forest uh, so we will discuss a few uh, just the names of some of them uh, when we choose the model we need to train the model when we have lots of data we do some sort of training so that we can use them but whether we have done the training right whether we can use the model to predict something or evaluate something uh so we need to be sure whether what we have done is useful or not so we need to do some kind of evaluation right and then reevaluate reevaluate and improve the model uh and in order to do five uh evaluate the model and improve the model uh we need to do the number six part which is hyperparameter tuning and optimization we optimize our model to give best results uh so uh, data collection these are a few methods uh that everyone uses to collect data for example uh, interviews this is one informal way to collect data uh, if you want to uh, for example i am working in a mobile company for example u phone or jazz and i want to see the customer behavior how many customers are uh, getting into my uh, mobile system and 
I want to predict how many customers are likely to leave. Right? For example, if uh, I think that a customer is going to leave, I'll give them some discount offers. Right? So uh, for that, I have to get some data that if a person is uh, using uh, my service and for example, he makes 100 calls per month. If in a particular month, he's only making 50 calls or 30 calls, then it may uh, ring an alarm that I need to do something in order to keep that customer to myself, right? And not uh, give it to a competitor. So uh, for that, I have to keep track of the transactions. Uh, another way is to do social media monitoring. This is very common when you want to do sentiment analysis of a company, right? What everyone is saying about a particular product. Uh, for example, what is everyone saying about RIFA, right? Or RIFA Mathematics Department or RIFA Computer Science Department? Uh, uh, if I want to do interviews, uh, then it will be a very biased one, right? For example, uh, uh, if I go and ask people about my company uh, where I am working, educator, right? In my face, everyone will say it is a very good company. Some of them, some of you might not even heard of it before, but the general response is yes, it is a very good company. Right? But uh, if someone uh, do not like my company, then a more honest opinion is available on social media when people just uh, say whatever they want. Right? So uh, uh, there are different softwares available to download the data from social media like Twitter, Facebook, etc. Uh, surveys. Uh, uh, surveys or feedbacks uh, are also very common, and all the students go through different surveys at the end of every semester. Right? When you are required to uh, rank your course, like how good was the course content, how good was the book, etc. Right? And that is also anonymous, just to give a uh, more genuine feedback. Uh, and typically these surveys are done through forms. Um, the last one is observations. Uh, observations are very important in case of uh, medical computing, medical imaging. Uh, for example, uh, let's talk about the area of uh, eye, right? retinopathy. Uh, uh, if I want to do some medical imaging or medical data science, I need lots of images, right? I go and consult some eye specialist, they will give me images, but those images will not be of any use until I know that this image corresponds to a person whose eyes are in perfect condition, or these eyes, images of these eyes correspond to uh, those uh, that need some kind of treatment. So uh, this is called annotation. Uh, good or bad, right? A or B. Uh, annotate different images or different data into different classes, right? Just to get an idea what is good, what is bad, uh, so that when we do some evaluation or do some prediction on those images, we can relate uh, whether this person needs a treatment or not, right? So just data. Uh, or just the images in this case is not meaningful unless we have some important related concerns. Okay, uh, if I get data, I need to do some pre-processing, right? The first part is cleaning. Cleaning involves uh, just going through the data and checking whether there are some incorrect information or not, right? For example, uh, if you have patient record, then due to sensitivity of the topic, the patient names are always deleted. Uh, we will have patient one, patient two, patient three, and so on. Uh, and no one can trace back who the patient one was, who the patient two was, which is fine. Uh, next come, then uh, there'll be some other patient related data, for example, age, right? Uh, age of 40, 45 is fine. Right? But if someone is typing age of 450, then that zero is probably some typing error. 
So we need to fix those. Or if we cannot fix those, we might need to delete those entries from the data uh, that may give us some incorrect information. Uh, again, there will be some missing data that we need to find and uh, write down those data. Okay. Then the pre-processing also includes a concept that's called dimensionality reduction. Uh, suppose we have a two-dimensional data, right? just the x-axis and the y-axis. Uh, x-axis, the number at the x-axis represents the input, and the number at the y-axis represents the output. And uh, if we have just two-dimensional data, uh, we can do a regression analysis and we can draw a regression line. And for every input, we can predict the uh, output, right? assuming the data was linear. Uh, but it is uh, uh, computationally, it is not a very simple technique. Suppose we have a data which is not two dimensional, but 20 dimensional. It will need more computational power. Okay? But if the data is not 20 dimensional, but uh, it consists of 20 million dimensions, right? then it will be impossible to visualize and the computation will be humongous. So there must be some technique to improve the efficiency. Efficiency means the time we need to uh, develop our model. So we need to reduce the dimensions. If somehow we can half the dimensions or uh, from 20 million, if we can reduce it to 20,000, then uh, without losing much information. Uh, for example, if we remove the column corresponding to age, Right? Uh, is it is that data important or not? Maybe it is giving us some important information. So we cannot randomly delete information. We need to figure out which column are more relevant and they need to be kept and which are uh, not relevant. For example, uh, address, right? Uh, um, address is generally not shared because of uh, sensitivity and confidentiality, but suppose it was here. Uh, it generally doesn't have much to do with medical data. So that will uh, eventually be dropped out. Similarly, phone numbers. Uh, it doesn't uh, correlate with the medical conditions. So it is not an important information as far as the human physique is concerned. Right? So uh, what we can do is uh, we can filter Right. Filter means uh, let's see how much uh, of the data each column, each entry corresponds or correlates uh, with the result that we are trying to find out. And the ones that that doesn't correlate much, we can drop those. Uh, similarly, the wrapper, wrapper, what wrapper function does is uh, it trains the model and then removes some of the columns and see what is the result. If it is giving us a positive result, we are better off leaving those. If not, then we'll put it back and drop some others, right? So this is a very time consuming effort. Uh, a better way is feature extraction. What, what feature extraction does is, it doesn't say that we have these 100 variables and we need to delete 50 of those. Maybe we can, combine some of those and make new features, right? So uh, this is the concept of principal component analysis, and we'll talk about this particular one uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, there are a few other well-known concepts like linear discriminant analysis and T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, TSN. These three are key features, key algorithms that are used in feature extraction, right? How can we combine the existing features into new features such that the total number of features are also reduced? And all three of them are math mathematically intensive, right? The mathematics concepts in each one of them is huge. Uh, you can guess this is more mathematics than computer science just by looking at their names, right? Linear discriminant analysis, right? 
this it seems that it has to do something with a linear function. Uh, and uh, you all know T distribution, right? You must have heard it studied in uh, probability and statistics, right? And stochastic systems, stochastics, uh, these are all terms used in mathematics. Okay? Uh, but I, I would like to talk a bit more about principal component analysis. But before I talk about principal component analysis, let's take a few minutes to uh, talk about Carl Pearson. Uh, how many of you had have heard this name before? OK. Uh -huh. Carl Pearson was the person who introduced the Pearson distribution. So, um, machine learning or data science, which is more famous right now, uh, 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 one of the keywords or buzzwords is data anal analytics. Uh, which we are discussing right now. And so we get data and we analyze it. And then we use that data and do some predictions. So this is not the whole data science, but just a part of it. So another important concept is data visualization. Right? So we get the data. How can we visualize it? Or how can we visualize the results? Uh, in a meaningful way. Suppose we have 50 columns. Uh, usually we talk about two dimensional data. Right? So, or histograms or pie charts. So how can we uh, visualize important data in a meaningful way? Right? This is mostly used in business because uh, whenever someone is giving a presentation to a CEO or someone who wants to invest in a company, they want to look at data, but uh, in a meeting, the time is short and we cannot look at all the data, especially if there are millions and millions of reports. So our data visualization techniques are, are used and applied to represent the data in a meaningful way. Okay, uh, Pearson distribution, uh, Carl Pearson introduced it. Uh, you must have heard it in statistics. Uh, Again, chi-square test. Uh, this was also introduced by Pearson. Uh, Pearson uh, did lots of work in statistics, and in his days, uh, people thought that every data will be normally distributed. But uh, during his studies, especially in the science of biokinetics, he discovered that some of the data is, is skewed. So Pearson distribution is a collection of uh, distributions which uh, normal distribution is a part of Pearson distribution, but it also contains skewed distributions as well. And when we study skewed distribution, uh, we talk about standard deviation. Right? We also talk about it in the normal distribution, but uh, it is also meaningful in standard in the skewed case. So Carl Pearson introduced this and uh, Carl Pearson also introduced Pearson Product moment correlation coefficient, right? a very lengthy name, uh, commonly known as correlation coefficient. Again, a key term in basic statistics. Uh, he also introduced the concept of histograms, a visualization technique to uh, represent or visualize data. Right? And uh, again, remember the timeline. This is 1857 to 1936. And Somewhere around 1905 or 1906, uh, Pearson introduced the principal component analysis. So uh, what is principal component analysis? Uh, principal component analysis is uh, um, OK. Uh, 
it is also known by several other names but uh, okay let me ask this question uh, how many of have of you have heard about the principal component analysis right uh, this is the term which is used in computer science and not in mathematics although uh, it was discovered by a mathematician right so here are the steps so uh, whatever data we have we normalize the data or standardize the data right? so that the mean is at zero and the standard deviation is at one uh, we do this just to remove remove the abnormality uh, suppose we don't do this so uh, any data with large numbers right so suppose we look at the age and we save it in years right one year is just one number unit one but if we are saving it in days it's 355 days it will have more effect so in order to re reduce the effect of larger values we normalize it uh, then we compute the covariance matrix right for every pair of data we compute the covariance right again a purely mathematical technique then uh, it's a covariance matrix is a square matrix. Uh, then we compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Again, eigenvalues and eigenvectors are pure concepts of linear algebra. And those eigenvectors uh, are selected in the principal component that are associated with the largest eigenvalue. So suppose we have eigenvalues 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. So uh, the most important eigenvalue is 10. And every we know that every eigenvalue corresponds to an eigenvector. So we will select that particular eigenvector. And before starting this process, we, we already we usually decide beforehand how many eigenvectors we are going to select. Okay. So uh, Suppose we have 1000 uh, components. If we decide just to select 100 key components, we'll pick the top 100 ones over here. Right? So the dimension is reduced from 100, from 1000 to 100. So uh, in linear algebra, have you done, uh, have you seen similar steps before? OK, there's a small homework. There, is a, there are two particular names uh, which you might have heard in linear algebra, right? And it is related to the eigenvalues, right? One of them is related to. So just when you, whenever you go back, just search what those keywords are. It will refresh your memory, right? And it, it will also refresh your memory that uh, what Someone discovered around 125 years earlier, it is still being used in mathematics as well as in computer science. Right? So uh, we all know computer science is evolving very quickly, but this is still being used. Right? And uh, now you know the reason why, just to remove, reduce the dimensions. Uh, okay, here are some of the models that are used. Uh, knife based support vector machines, K nearest neighbors. Uh, let me give you a quick example of K nearest neighbors. Suppose I have data in two dimensions, uh, and So here are some points, and suppose I took these points from um, from an image of cats and dogs, right? This is the most common example. And suppose blue is for cats. Okay. 
and the red one is for doubt. And somehow after reducing the dimensions to two, I'm able to plot them. Now, uh, if I get a new point, uh, which is over here, Now the question is this new point, uh, is it a cat or a dog? It, uh, let's put some more red dogs. So uh, we can see that uh, in this region, there are more blues. So uh, most of the cats are over here. And in this region, there are more red dogs. So uh, this is the region for the dogs. So a green dot over here means it is what, a cat or a dog? Most probably a cat. But the algorithm says that we look at K neighbors, right? and if the value of K is three, for example, then it will look at three nearest neighbors, which is these three, and look at the majority. Right? And it is giving us a wrong result because we have picked a value of k which is not meaningful. If we have picked k is equal to five, then we would have get, get you will get a different result, right? So uh, k over here is a parameter which needs to be finalized before starting the whole process. Right? So here k is a hyperparameter. We cannot change it in between the algorithm. Uh, yes. Uh, we need to test it, uh, test different values of K and then decide. Uh, right. So, for example, we uh, pick K is equal to three, run the whole process and see what are the results at the end. Then we change the value of K and then um, see again. So it depends what kind of data we are getting. Uh, Again, linear regression, nonlinear regression, uh, logistic regression, decision trees, random forest, and the most famous neural networks. These are some of the models. Uh, okay, these models can be divided into two parts. Uh, some of them are for classification, right? Cats and dogs. Uh, some of them can be used for multiple classification as well, right? Uh, picking a class uh, of more than two, right? Three classes, five classes. Uh, in uh, most of the times, we only have two classes, but uh, there are algorithms that can deal more than two as well. And uh, again, uh, some of these. Uh, give something that is called, that can be called extrapolation or interpolation. Uh, these might be the words you, you have heard before. Uh, these are called regression techniques, right? Linear regression and non-linear regression specifically. Uh, they are used to predict some number. For example, if I give data of uh, all the previous T20 matches, then that model will be able to give some results. For example, uh, how much score will Babar Azam make in his next match? Right? Uh, we can run the model and see the accuracy, right? Uh, whether it is giving us a correct result or not. But one of the data which is missing is what? Uh, the playing ground, right? Uh, we don't have much data of international T20 cricket in the United States. And uh, all those who are interested in cricket knows that the pitch conditions in Australia are fast. Pitch conditions in the UK, uh, the ball swings a lot. And we have a slow dead pitch in uh, these, this phase in Pakistan. And India. But we don't have much data uh, from the US. So still it will give some number because that's what it is made to do, give an output. Uh, 
uh, maybe you can do uh, run the algorithm and see the results. Okay, so uh, after we have picked the correct model, depending upon we want to do regression or classification, we feed the data to our model and we do the training. The model is trained, which means that the machine learning algorithm learns whatever it needs to learn. And then we evaluate the model. Suppose I have uh, 100 data points or 100 entries, and I do my training on all those 100 data points. Now I need to test it. For testing, either I can create more data uh, or use some of the previous ones that I have used for training, uh, which is not a good idea because those numbers my algorithm has already seen, and it can predict the output just by remembering those numbers. So we need to divide the data into parts. A part for training, a part for evaluating. And if my evaluation results are bad, for example, if I'm getting an accuracy of only 50%, uh, it is as good as a coin toss, right? So if I'm getting a 50% over here, I can as well toss a coin and say if it is head, it's a cat, and if it's a tail, it's a dog, right? 50% means that. So in order to improve that, I need to do some hyperparameter tuning, right? Uh, in K, KNN algorithm, K nearest neighbors algorithm, the K is a hyperparameter. Uh, here are some more hyperparameters. For example, the learning rate. Uh, if the learning rate is fast, for example, in uh, the gradient descent in which the algorithm moves towards the optimal solution, uh, if it is moving at a faster rate, it can overshoot. Right? Uh, so that learning rate has to be controlled. Epochs is the number of cycles. Uh, in neural networks, uh, there are hidden layers, how many layers of learning, and then we have nodes, uh, K we have already talked about. In decision trees, uh, we have branches, right? And uh, how many data we need to keep for training and how much data we need to keep for testing, right? So um, over here, we talked about that we will keep some data for training uh, and the rest for testing. How much we will talk about it later? So uh, these are the hyperparameters that we can, or the algorithm will uh, fine tune itself after every cycle, right? Epoch is a cycle. And uh, after every epoch, uh, for example, if we are running our algorithms for 10 epochs or 10 iterations, it will uh, fine tune the hyperparameters 10 times. Uh, okay. So, for evaluation, um, I train my data and test my data. Okay. Then I again train my data and then test my data. So whenever I test my data, I'm feeding some data points to the algorithm. And my algorithm might learn something from it. So if it is learning something from it, uh, those data points cannot be used for further validation or further testing. So generally, the idea is to split the data into three parts. Uh, one is purely for training. And after every iteration, when I do the evaluation, the second part is used for testing how good the training has been, just to fine tune the hyper parameters. And after all the training has been done, at the absolute end, we need to evaluate with some data that hasn't been used so far, so that it is a pure uh, testing that can be uh, duplicated in real life. So uh, we need to divide the data points into three parts, training, testing, and evaluation. And these are the three splits that is uh, generally used. There's no 
absolute rule that you have to do this and you cannot do this. But this is what generally what is being generally used in releases. And that's it from my side. ट्यून कर रहे होते हम नहीं वो एल्गोरिदम खुद ही कर रहे होते 